Hey, everybody. We're here streaming on Facebook. Well, you know, that's not really my favorite thing to do, but this is going to work well because I have a guest. I was actually lucky enough to have this young lady sitting here next to me. It's Christine Johns, and we're going to be talking today about the mail order bride industry. And what's so interesting about Christine is that she not only knows about it, she lived the, lived it personally because her mom was a foreign bride. Her dad, as she tells me, didn't necessarily look for her on a catalog or in the website. He went to the country that he, he bought her, you know, over from. But um, the industry has evidently really changed. I mean, you know, Christine and I are not spring chickens. So you figure, you know, that was however many years ago. Things have changed different, are much different now. And now people just sit on the internet and find their bride. So Christine, I wanted to do a little bit of introduction. Christine sent me a very nice bio. She says, um, my mom is a mail order bride from Finland. Dad grew up in Staten, Staten Island. He turned out to be a violent sadist who physically, sexually, and emotionally abused me and my mother. Oh my God. And she went along with the abuse and allowed it. And you moved to many different states before you were 10, but high school and college in the Virginia, Maryland area. So you want to pick up from there? So since you went to college and then you were a model and... Yeah, so um, I ended up going to University of Maryland and then after school, I came up to NYC. So I got involved in the event production game, the music game, DJing and all that stuff. So I was just down there, yeah, and I modeled and, you know, I did a little bit of everything and it was just a high paced lifestyle. And it was a very like now lifestyle, like, in order to participate in it, you can forget about all of your past because you have the opportunity to just be this whole brand new person. And, you know, not a lot of your friends come up there. I don't think even one of my friends from Virginia or Maryland, you know, came up there and got involved in this lifestyle. So it was like I had the ability to start fresh and just kind of bury what I had to go through in my childhood. So, but um, what, uh, what would you say? Um, now you said here that you started you know, hearing about men's rights organizations. How did that, and then talking about uh, connecting that to the male order bride industry, you know, how did you hear about that and how did you feel about it? Okay, well, after I left, I finally left Manhattan like 19 years later and it was due to an illness that I had. I had lived in a building with mold and I got- Oh no. Yeah, so I needed to just get out of that toxic environment. And there was a bunch of other toxicity down there too. Manhattan is not the most supportive place for women, especially in music. It's it's hard, or it's at least the place that I was in, like the branch of music, alternative, underground, like there's there can be a lot of woman hating in there and um and i was receiving like a lot of it and um it, and then i physically got ill too so i needed to just relax and i got a cottage up in upstate new york and then of course all the things that i was burying just started coming out and i had to deal with them with counseling and i started educating myself on youtube because now there was a whole other wave of therapy that was going on finding out about narcissistic abuse which most guys who want like an unequal relationship are cluster B. They're basically narcissists. They have some form of personality disorder in which they want themselves to be up here and their and the women that they're involved with to be down here. And so that you know if they get a mail order bride, this fits that perfectly. So anyway, I found out about that new wave of counseling and I started getting involved with a lot of the channels. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention specific channels on here or no, not. No, let's not we try, I try to avoid that because it got it's it. Touchy. Okay. Okay, so whatever, I found a bunch of really cool um, channels that were helping me out with this. And it's really wonderful what's going on today because counselors can now deal with people on YouTube and tailor their, you know, their advice to the needs of the people who write in. So it was really right. exciting. And then I got a lot of really specific help for my particular problem, which I had never had before. I had paid a whole bunch of money for counseling and therapy and it just didn't work because they, you know, they don't have any idea that of the le the the level of abuse that can go on when the person it when one person holds paperwork over the other person. Right. It's, it's literally like slavery. So all this started coming out, and then I also on YouTube I started seeing stuff floating by that was like men's rights and midtown and all this stuff. And one of the main things that they were pushing was mail order brides because. 
they want this unequal relationship. They're mad that women are now independent and we broke away from having to be, you know, acquiesced to men and everything. And they're, they're actually upset about this. Oh, and, they are livid. <laughs> and so they want, they, they are pushing their members to go and find women from other countries to abuse. And it is so, so sad. And that's exactly what happened in my family. So I just wanted to try to get some of the information out about how this is a really bad thing to do. And they're, the guys who think that it's going to work out in their favor, they're wrong. So, right. Really? Well, yeah. let's talk about that a little bit later. Let's talk about first about, um, so did you ever ask your dad what was, what was his motivation for going overseas to get someone to marry? I never. I'm not an American woman. Yeah, well, I didn't have to ask him because he was always, you know, saying why. And um, he he himself held the view that, you know, Americans, Americans in general, and particularly American women were not good. And I had to hear this in my house all the time about how we were better than other families because we weren't an American family, even though he was born in Staten Island. So my father, <laughs> he was a better, I know. So... Um, and I had to hear that all the time about how we were better than other families. I think that's how he hooked her in was because then she got to feel special because she was supposedly better. Because my mom was also a narcissist, but she was like a quiet narcissist, like a covert borderline narcissist. But she would do her dirt quietly, whereas my father was the pit bull and he was more outward and just screaming all the time and just getting drunk, throwing things. And he basically threw oh me God. around the table. Huh? I was saying, oh my God. Yeah. So basically like my mom, I'm sure there must've been like a honeymoon period after she met him. Like he went over there and he was trolling around for women. And so like basically right as soon as I could talk, my mom was telling me these things and she was saying that my father had found several women and sent postcards to several different women to come back and then chose the one that he liked the best. And that, yeah, and basically, I, I had I always had to know that my mom was like second or third choice. So, and yeah, and he had he had preferred a French woman, and that French woman had said no. And so, yeah, so he basically was like picking and choosing, like in a grocery store, like he's buying shoes. Yeah, basically. And oh, then how, so, how sad. Yeah, and then my mother like actually told me about this. So basically, I got to grow up feeling like oh, you know, we were only choice number two or three. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's it was sickening. And then, you know, like, so I'm sure there must have been like a honeymoon period, you know, at first in any, like in any relationship. It's like, oh, now I'm in a relationship that my significant other is here. This is great. And then my mother told me that he got used to really fast. So like she mentioned that she missed her family and her country and he hit her. That was his response. So that's when the abuse started. He pushed her when she was pregnant. He freaked down on her. He was. It turned out he was an alcoholic. And so he was like drinking in the home all the time, constantly. And then when I was born, one of the first things I can even remember was them fighting and then my father attacking me in my crib for crying. And I. that's all I can remember, yeah. And then like throughout, throughout my growing up time, like I was attacked multiple times physically and just down talk to you. My father was a professor, so he really did think he was more intelligent and this higher level of, of a person than anybody else. And it was it was gross. He wasn't <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and so what what okay, so yeah, you said there may have there's probably a honeymoon period. Did your yeah. mom ever talk about, you know, how he was when they first met? What motivated her to come here and marry him do you know well, she felt she felt a sense of failure because she was expected to move out and i guess start her own life by her family and i guess it, you know they'd had seven children and finland at that time was very poor so um it was a poor country and you know she was expected to find a husband and move out this is like 1967 1968 and then um so she went to Liverpool, England, where she worked as a maid for, you know, one year and then she was fired off of being a maid. So she had actually dated a bunch of guys over there who were Indian and like dark skinned and that's what she liked. And but none of those relationships worked out for her. And so she was on her way home in defeat from getting fired. And there was my dad on the boat and he was over there trolling. Uh -huh. Yeah, so basically he changed his plans and immediately he was over at her house. She just had no boundaries and she let him come 
over to her farm and like meet her family and stuff. And he changed his plans and he went over there and they only spent like a couple weeks together. And then, you know, he left or whatever. And then she got this postcard saying, hey, will you come with me to the United States and be my wife? And she took, she took the opportunity without knowing the guy. So, and this is often how it happens. It doesn't have to happen like online, but you know, like if you, if you haven't met any, that I person, see. if you haven't had an opportunity to know them and, and know what they're all about, like they could actually end up being psychotic. And why couldn't they find a girlfriend where they live? You know what I mean? See, bingo. That is the main reason that I think that this is so dangerous because, you know, the women don't really understand or they think that, you know, this guy is just looking for someone that he can get along with. But in, in every single instance that I've been, you know, been watching, observing them, all they talk about is they put down American women, how American women don't want them, aren't, aren't good, aren't submissive, don't know how to be wives anymore you know, don't honor and respect their men. And they have this vision in their mind that getting a woman from another country, they'll have ultimate power and control over her, even if, you know, it's economic because she doesn't speak the language. She has no support system. And they feel absolutely, I mean, that just, just makes their bubble of excitement, boy, because they feel like they're going to have total control over this woman. And they promote that. And all the guys, when you look at them, are losers. I mean, they have major personality issues. They're ugly as hell. They're like like 400 pounds. I mean, just it's always something that no woman would want. And or if they're not, they get if, a bribe, bribe yeah. from overseas. Yeah, if they are good looking, it's usually their personality. Like they're usually right. a pure status or something terrible, which my father had all three. Like he was prematurely balding. He started going bald when he was 15. So that's a major detriment in the dating oh, 15. world. 15? Yeah. Some men have just an overabundance of whatever hormone that is, and they start losing their hair very early. So that was my dad. So that's a barrier to dating. And then he also had a crazy personality. Like there was just something wrong with him in general. Like he had a personality disorder really bad. And so, you know, he had tried to date American women. It didn't work out. And I think he had a resentment about that. And so he developed the view that, oh, these European women were like more loyal, more this, more that. and. So he found one and brought her over here without knowing her. And my mom really suffered. I mean, like we were moved 10 times. I think he kept us moving because then we were always new and like nobody knew us. And so right. we couldn't call up friends. And as soon as we were allowed to stay in the same place for like two or three years, here came the neighborhood moms because like the screaming, like my father was one of those predators that gets off on their victims screams like Freddy Krueger, seriously. So oh he was, he would grab me and like throw me like a rag doll and I would actually be scared that I was going to die and my heart would be beating so fast and I would scream and my then they would, he would go fight my mom and they would, you, all you'd heard was like screams coming out the window and so the neighborhood moms you know heard it and they confronted my mother and um there was another situation my mother like after she was confronted by these mothers you know in a group and they were telling her listen like you have to get away from this man he's destroying your daughter and yourself like and we lived in a low income neighborhood. So you would think that like, this is an intact family, a mother, a father, and they make like, okay money kind of for the time. And, you know, and, and we lived in a, in a low income neighborhood with a bunch of single moms, but they were the ones feeling sorry for us. I felt envious of those single mom families. And I wished I could be them because their mothers had the strength to throw out the abuse of man. So they actually had much better lives than I did. And those kids heard the screams coming out of my house every night and they felt sorry for me. It wasn't the other way around. Like I was looked at as like the most, the least fortunate person in the neighborhood, not the other way around. The single mom kids had it great. Like they could lounge around in their room and not worry that someone was going to come in there and flip out on them and beat their ass, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Oh my God. yeah. So I, you know, and so I was begging my mother, like, please, like you have to just, take me take me and leave and I had been begging her to do that since I was a little kid and she ne she wouldn't do it like my mom didn't want to be a single mom she didn't want that stigma she wanted to have two salaries and she was just like to her the money was worth me being in pain and being scared all the time so oh, wow. wow yeah so that's the problem is that she grew up really poor there were seven children and so 
my mom like had values that were wor much, much worse than American women, much worse. Because American women, like if you've been raised in a situation of abundance, you're happy, generous, happy-go-lucky and compassionate. Right, but in those, right. in those situations where you're raised in, an, in a place where there's not enough food for all seven kids, that compassion just gets switched off. So that, um, let me just turn that down a bit. So basically like she had no compassion, like for her, she's like, oh, well, you're only getting beaten. You didn't actually starve, which is, which is actually not true. Like I went through periods where my parents would just either forget to feed me or maybe my dad was doing it on purpose. And I actually passed out in school because I didn't have enough food. So, and the teacher was like, what's the teacher thought that I was ignoring the class and actually threw me out of the classroom. And then when they realized that the reason why I was just spacing out was because I didn't have enough food, then they were sorry they did that. But so, you know, like, and then I would come to school, like in the worst rags, clothes with holes in it, hair all tangled up. And, you know, the, the teacher would call my mom and my mom would actually get mad at the teacher. She wouldn't get mad at the fact that she was being forced to live this way because she was from, you know, like a dirt poor background. And to her, like, even if you had some clothes with holes and stuff, that was better than, you know, what oh, she no. had. Right. Yeah, and, and you know. My, <clears throat> do, you, do think you think that, that in some of the instances, the men are searching for a woman who has those economic disadvantages because of the very reasons that you just listed? It basically makes her more controllable. Is, do yeah, you, would then, you agree with that statement? Absolutely. But then see, like, that's not good because when you get somebody who's been starved then, and now they're trying to save every dollar, that's not a fun person to have in your family. Like, you know, they don't want to go to Disneyland or go to a movie or, you know, my parents never went out. They never spent a dollar on anything that they didn't have to. It was like they were sick or something. They had no social life except for a couple of other international couples that they found. And literally, like my, I missed every single movie in the 80s. I wasn't taken to see it. Like I had no life and th because my mom felt like she had to save all this money. So it's a disorder, like, you know, so it, it was pretty terrible. And, um, and I just didn't even realize because that was my normal. So, and then I would see other kids getting to do stuff and I felt really bad about it. But at the same time, I was just used to what I had always known. And then my dad was, and then he would use the excuse, well, we're better than that. We don't watch Hollywood movies and we don't, you know what I mean? Like he would always try to make it seem like the way we were living was better than everybody else. And it was far, far worse. And, and so, and this woman was letting him do it. So now when have you met um, other uh, women who were male order brides at all and yeah. uh, what what can you give me kind of you know a quick overview of what their lives were like was it similar to your mom's yeah just terrible like I one of the things I neglected to say was that my father also decided that he was this nudist and decided that he didn't need to wear clothes in the house so yeah so I had to walk through the living room like I would hide in my room and then just come out to use the bathroom and then go back in my room. But on the way from the bathroom, from my room to the bathroom and back, oh I, would my God. See, I would have to see a naked man. And this happened for years. So yeah. And um, so basically I've seen this, you know, I was working at a club in New York City and there was a lady from Ecuador and she had this lawyer husband and he had also decided that they were swingers. So she had to basically do what he said and go to all these swinger clubs. And they were always trying to invite me to a swinger club. And I was like, no, thanks. <laughs> but no, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's what she had to do to keep her American husband happy. You see what I'm saying? And oh my goodness gracious. And then, and then he was a lawyer so that when she finally left the situation, thankfully she did leave. Um, you know, he was able to cut her off with nothing. So they figure out ways that they don't have to, you know, pay out. Like they hadn't had any kids and somehow he figured out a way that he didn't have to pay her anything. And so she went from living in like a really nice house in Long Island, like a really huge house, to having zero. So and that they figure out because they're not like they're doing this because they're predators. And so they're predators in other ways than just getting the mail order bride. You know what I'm saying? Like they figure out. Yeah, they're very smart and. 
they figure out ways to like screw that person every time they turn around. So the only remedy for it is to just get away. But my mom got Stockholm syndrome in and she became a, an abuser later on. Like it was like at first she started out like trying to help me and trying to shield me from my father. But like the older that I got, she kind of fell in with it. And, and towards the end of it, when I reached my teen years, she was an abuser too. And she was also screaming throwing things, battering my door down. Like she took a pickaxe from the garden that she was using to dig dirt with and smashed it all the way through my, my bedroom door when I was like 16 and oh stuff like goodness. that. Yeah, because at that point she had been battered and abused and abused and battered like so much that she just had all this adrenaline and now she, was, she would grab my bookcase and like slammed it on the floor and all the books went everywhere. And like, this is the type of stuff she was doing like towards the end. And so, yeah, what like- a nightmare, you poor thing. Thanks. Yeah, I will. It's been a long time. I mean, I've been gone from them since I was 18 years old, thankfully. And there's even more stuff like they continue to abuse like because then what happens is, you know, you're away from the situation and your mind kind of minimizes it. So you don't want to be that person that just doesn't have any family. So I kept on trying to I kept on thinking that like age would mellow them out, but it doesn't like it turns out that when somebody has a personality disorder, they're stuck like that for life. Oh, and yeah, they, forever. Sometimes they even get worse. So there's a situation now where she did try to leave my dad and she fell in love with her boss at work, a Russian guy um, who was basically more like her. And so she had a kid with this guy and she was gonna try to leave my dad and then it didn't work out. He, did, he already had a wife and kids and was married. And he was basically like the office predator that was going around trying to sleep with all the available, all the women who would do it, he would sleep with them. So my mom fell for this and actually fell in love with him and had a child that was his within the relationship to my dad. So it got complicated, yeah. And then, so that happened when I was 13. And then um, basically like that child is now her mini me. And she, cause she allowed me to be the Cinderella and take all the abuse, but then she turned that child into the golden child because she was in love with that child's father, but not my right, father. Not your dad, right. So now she couldn't have the father, so she turned that girl into her kind of like a daughter-wife situation where she's her emotional partner. And I didn't know it for years. I didn't understand the dynamics of narcissistic personality disorder. And I just knew that like they were keeping me kind of at arm's length. Like they were never like a warm, welcoming family. <laughs> Let's put it that way, even after I left. And um, then it turns out that now, like I thought we somehow mended our relationship because I was going down there like a couple times a year and like spending Christmas or some holidays with them. And they were able to kind of like hold it together and be semi-normal. But then it turned out, no, actually they were just setting me up because now my sister, my half sister moved and got married and is having kids now. And so my mother picked up the whole house and moved right across from her. And I'm no longer welcome to visit the family um, for no reason. I didn't do anything. It's just, you know. Um, Girl, you, know, you shouldn't yeah. want to when they sound cray cray. Yeah, I don't I want to. Yeah, so, but you know, because you have to understand the ramifications of being in the United States with no family, you don't have a safety net. Like when I got sick, I literally had nowhere to stay. They wouldn't even let me stay in my old room, even though it was empty and just sitting there. So I had to live anywhere that I could on my friend's living room floor and in an office space and all this stuff. Cause I couldn't work for like three months. So I just have to, had to exist off of the little bit of money that I had saved. And in the meantime, my credit was getting wrecked. I was visiting all these doctors. And, and in that situation, I realized like how horrible it is when you don't have family that you can rely on like most people right. have like a mom or a dad or an aunt or somebody that they can just go to if they have a terrible accident and you know when you're in this situation it's like you don't you know my mom's whole family some of the people in my mom's family actually like me and we talk on facebook but they're in finland you know what i'm saying oh. I, can't, I can't go to oh, that's finland not right so and then my on my father's side most of the people in his family stopped talking to him gee big surprise so I would, that basically my father's mental illness isolated me from the father's side as well. So I was left with nothing. And then I, I thought I had like a mom, a sister, and then they turned out to have their own little alliance against me. So I have nothing. I literally have no family now, but I have my friends because now I realized the situation that I was in and I started building a lot closer relationships with my friends. But I would have done that way sooner if I thought, like, cause my mind again was playing tricks and I thought like, oh, well my parents might've been terrible when I was growing up, but I know that if I have an illness or something like that, I can go and crash with them. But then it actually happened and it turned out 
No. Nothing like that. I, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to share some some information I got on this mail order bride industry. Um, there's done a lot of places have done investigative reports, and it looks like from what you know the numbers I could gather that men pay. Keep this in mind. Now they're supposed to be in love or whatever. They pay anywhere between five and twenty-five thousand dollars for this quote wife. Yeah. Now all the similarities what you just related and everything I was reading the way that these men promote this it just sounds to me like these companies are pimps. These companies are pimping these they act as a me intermediary between a woman and a man and it's a setup for sex. To me that's pimping. They don't yep. want to call it that but that's what it is. So what it, to me this industry is nothing but a legal sex trafficking industry. Yeah, well anytime you provide access to young women, you know, it that's what it is. <laughs> Sexual access to young women. What does that sound like? I that's what I mean, I you know they put pretty bows on it and stuff and try to make laws of, you know, about how you have to be treated and support them and all this old stuff. But the bottom line is, you know, they're getting women that don't many have, have many options in most cases. Not all, because a lot of women who come from Russia are like doctors and therapists and stuff. You know, they just want to, they don't want to marry a Russian. So they're looking for a different kind of man. But the majority seem to be women that, you know, like you described your mom being, you know, not necessarily from wealthy families, very well educated. You know, they, they're needy. They need things. Men take advantage of it. Predators is a good word. Yeah, they're predators. And, you know, no matter how you slice and dice it, anytime you're selling sexual access to a woman, that's being a pimp. I don't care how many bows you put on it or if you say like, oh, well, a certain, you can't rely on the exceptions and make excuses for what you're doing. Okay, there could be two doctors and there'll be like 100,000 poor women from farms. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it, it is sexual access to women that is being sold. And it's even worse because, it, you know, if they were just doing it like it's done here, the man would only get one hour with that woman or whatever. Right. In this case, she has to live in his house. So it's far worse for her, far, far worse than just being a regular, whatever you want to call it in this country. They are the bottom of the barrel. They have to put up with the most. That guy is going to take out and project all his insecurities, anger and all that stuff right on her. And... If she wants that green card, she has to stay and put up with it. And I've seen it happen. Like there was one girl I know I knew in New York and her husband was abusing her. And she was just telling me like, oh, if I can only just make it to this one hearing where they're going to then give me my green card, you know, and she was just trying to hold on until that day. And oh. yeah, so and they know it like they understand how much time they have to abuse this woman. It's and not so they like, take full advantage of it. Yes, they do. Well, I was looking at you mentioned when we were we had a little conversation before the show started, and you mentioned Anastasia Date, and this comp this person, the investigative reporter for Fortune magazine, wrote uh, did a you know like some research on the company, and they said the revenue numbers for the mail order bride industry are difficult to come by, but Anastasia Date shared its sales and growth statistically statistics exclusively with Fortune. The company made a reported 110 million in 2012. For 2013, it projects it will make 140 uh, million. And the site's traffic grew 220% in 2012 over the previous year. It now has 4 million users who currently spend some 360 million hours on the site per year, and it racked up 2.6 million votes visits in March alone, and this article was printed April 9th, 2013 in Fortune magazine. So there's a lot of men interested in purchasing women for whatever reason that they have. And this is some scary stuff, scary stuff. Yeah. But look at all the money. This is 2012. So that's what, six years ago? Well, I have a theory like, you know, this is a hard capitalism that we're in. and. It's encouraging people from day one to believe that everything you need, you can purchase. So there's, you know, and I call it like a vulture kind of society because they're, you know what I mean? The mentality is just like, whatever, I, my money can just buy me everything. And 
you know what I mean? It, it leads people to be callous and not care about others' feelings. And it's a whole, it's a whole narcissistic culture. And so of course there's going to be all these responses to, oh, you mean all I have to do is pay, you know, this amount of money and I get to do this. Like they don't care about the morals. They don't care if it's wrong to do that to a human being. Like there's very few morals in an, in an ultra capitalism, like the one that we live in. They pay lip service to the morals, but really they just do whatever they want to do with their money. So, um, and also I wanted to mention, like I read about this FBI sting that they did and it was somewhere out in, in Nevada or something where they actually went on the dark web and they advertised real slaves. And they said that they had like 10 women who were captured from other countries and they got so many responses. They, there were men on the dark web who wanted to purchase illegally a, a woman and you know what I mean, like undercover and do all kinds of things to her. And they got literally like thousands of responses and they were like, yes, I'm interested in the property that, like they were calling these women properties and everything. Yeah, and they had to, the FBI actually have arrested a whole bunch of people with that sting. But it just goes to show you like who is living here. So after knowing all this, it just makes me paranoid. You know what I'm saying? Like, cause the guy sitting next to me could want to purchase a so-called property on the dark web. And well, they love, they think enough of, of women of property when you just meet them and you work with them, you know, just the way that they uh, that they've been known to speak to women like, you know, you're nothing and uh, that you're there to, to meet their needs and make their dreams come true. And that's why you know they have so many assaults on women, because we have these men had a sense of entitlement and they want to feel they want to feel like what you described, like they have all this power and control and are dominant over yeah. women who are telling them, oh, hell no, you're not going to dominate me. So they get even angrier and then they go on the line and find a, a foreign woman who can barely even speak English and sometimes in some instances. Yeah, it, it's really ugly. And um, the problem is a lot worse than we thought, you know, in this country, like it's way worse than Europe. Like I think it's, I don't know about Europe, but I, I'm getting the feeling that European men, you know, for centuries have been used to queens and dominant mm -hmm. women like they could elect a female prime minister and she's ruling over there right now and like but over here i feel like this area is a lot more like the middle east because you know you have some men over here who are serious serious woman haters and oh absolutely barely under the surface so my message to women who are in these other countries whether they're in asia whether they're in the middle east whether they're in africa whether they're in europe or scandinavia do not come over here these men have gotten kind of a good press but the truth is that they're just as bad as middle eastern countries over here some of them and if there's a, if there is somebody who's attracted to this business it's because they have a personality disorder it's you know the, the worst people are attracted to stuff like this anywhere they have access to vulnerable people so they go for jobs like you know police officer correctional facility attendant hospitals like you know what I mean? Those are the ones with the personality disorders. So if there is a service that's that's offering access to young women, the ones that respond to it are going to be the sickest ones. So you can't oh, use wow. yeah, you can't use this service to find a husband. You have to just try to do it naturally, like organically, through friends, and hope you get you know a good one. Because over what? here, it's a very what, high. Um, do you think? So what, let's just let's talk about what motivates a woman to sign up for this service. What would you say are the, I don't know, say top five reasons that um, a woman might do this? Top five is like poverty is number one. Like basically these women are coming from anywhere that's poor. It's easy to understand. So the, the men in the rich country want to buy the women in the poor country. It's supply and demand. So any place where the woman has to struggle just to get daily food or her family might be pushing her out. Maybe it's a place where it's normal to have seven or eight kids and they just have too many and you got to go. And, you know, or, or a place where there's not that many good guys. I heard, you know, in Russia, they say like, oh, you know, the guys are really sexist, but you're not right. getting, you're got, not getting anything better over here. If you do, you're, there are some good men, like, don't get me wrong. I'm not like a man hater and I love men and stuff like that but it's just and I've tried to date here and you know there is an overabundance of woman hating men over here so you just oh, I agree I yeah. totally agree so and they're coming out now like the internet is unmasking them and letting them come out of the shadows so they feel like they have anonymity because I could always feel something before like even from the first part of my dating life I could feel that like there was some type of animosity but, um, and even if I was sincerely and innocently trying my best in a relationship, sometimes it would just 
not work out and the guy would be like angry and because I went through so much with my my dad I just knew that I had to leave that situation right so um but like I could feel it but now you can actually see it like you could some of these guys took to the internet and started voicing their views and so they're unmasking the the hidden vitriol that was there all along so I don't know, maybe this is a good way of just getting it out and airing it out. Maybe the next generation or the generation after that will be able to have an easier time, but we're still in the doo-doo, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's important to have these kind of conversations too, yeah. because a lot of women take the you know the, 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 the charges from these MGTOW and these guy, angry guys as a criticism of themselves. So the guys are like, well, you don't know how to be a wife anymore. And you American women, I can't stand feminists. You know, they all these things that these negative things that they associate with a woman who stands her ground and is assertive and demands proper treatment and this kind of thing. They can't stand those women. But a lot of young girls haven't really developed the psychic shield yet to be able to protect themselves from that kind of, you know, that kind of message. So they're yeah. they're internalizing some kind of rejection of themselves and feeling like they're not good enough for somebody who's a knucklehead. You shouldn't want to be bothered with them anyway. So I think hearing your story about, um, you know, what kind of guys there are out there might hopefully wake them up. If they're hearing these messages from men, please understand that this is not a guy you should feel bad about being rejected by. You should be having a parade and doing yes. backflips and just, you know, doing the running man and the cabbage patch and all that because these guys are crazy. They're crazy. So I really yes. appreciate you saying, you know, sharing. Yeah, there's something just deeply that went wrong in relations between men and women and these men have decided to try to cling on to values that are just dead that ship has sailed they're never going to be able to find a woman like their mother but i think what it is is the instinct is to try to find a woman like their mother so gen x still had some mothers that were forced to stay with the father it was still hard to get hired in a job and stuff like that so they watched their mother take blows and they watched their mother get cheated on and get you know all this bad stuff happened to her but then the women of our you know gen x women themselves are not going to put up with it so there was a dichotomy between what they had at home and who raised them and who was available in the dating market so that's why they're like freaking out they can't find someone like their mom because that ship has sailed there are no more because they changed that ship sunk <laughs> yeah, <so> <laughs> <laughs> Let so, me read you a comment one of the posters put up about um, yeah. she agrees with you that desperation is the top reason. She yes. says her late husband's ex-wife wanted to get out of Thailand. Her family had tons of children and expected her to quote work the bars aka prostitution to help support the family that these men demand to be born. Right. Um, and she says, you know, we do not have it just to justify why we hate these men. They are dangerous and horrible. We would hate wild animals acting like this, but not expect to hate humans who are so misogynistic. Yeah, and they and try to I have to agree. And not change. So, you know, it's so funny that a turn that not attorney comedian uh, Louis. I talked about him one time because he had this skit where he was talking about dating, and in one in one of the lines there, he makes a statement that's so profound. I mean, people laugh during the skit, but it's so profound. He says, you know, guys, women. Uh, I mean, guys worry about a woman hurting their feelings and, you know, hurting their ego and being rejected. But women have to worry about us killing them. And yeah. it's so true. So many of the stories of the, of these brides um, that ended up dead or missing. They don't know where the women are. They don't know where oh, the women are. I could easily have ended up dead. Like a child's bones are very fragile. And I was actually held up by the front of my shirt and like pinned against walls or grabbed and thrown onto my bed or grabbed by the arm and I think the only thing that saved me is that I'm a natural athlete and I had strong bones and muscle tissues and had I been a more fragile child I might not have made it like you know there's all kinds of news stories about children getting killed by their parents and um, oh yeah you know there was one story in particular that struck me like the man took his daughter and hit her head against the faucet in the bathroom and she died and I was hit like that on many occasions so I easily could have died so I I am just thankful that I made it out of there and you know he was a rageaholic he was getting off on screaming and crying and violence and stuff like that and um and my mom was just putting up with it and that and that was the terrible thing is that and she's still there now she is still living with this man. So, but now of course he can't do anything because now he's in his seventies, but 
you know, and, but then the game is changed. So now they don't, they're not physically strong, but they try to hurt me in other ways, like banning me from the family on holidays. Emotionally, yeah. yeah. So, cause they always, there was always an emotional component too. You know, I have to share this story because I, you know, I used to do, uh, I had used to have a singles group and I used to put on cruises uh, for singles. It'd be, you know, 50, 80 people. We'd all get on these cruises together. And there was this guy that, you know, he used to come a lot. He was a heavy drinker and I mean, like very intelligent. He worked for some software company in Silicon Valley. And um, at one point he invited a lot of the crew members, to, you know, cruise people to his home and to meet his quote, new wife. So we go there and it's this little tiny, I don't know, Filipinos, uh, Thai, I don't know what, 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 what Asian she was, little tiny thing. She looked like she couldn't have been any older than 21. And, uh, and she had like a six year old daughter. And he had, you know, brought her over and, you know, the mail order. I mean, he was talking about it openly. And I didn't, at that time, I didn't know anything about it. This was in the late 90s, maybe 2000 or whatever. And I didn't really know much yeah. about the industry at that time. But um, this girl, I don't know, she took to me for some reason. So she's like, um, she had this outfit on, some kind of like figure revealing spandex cheap thing. And then he's like, well, why don't you go change? You know, let everybody see your, your clothes and everything and show Deb, you know, the house and all this because he had bought this house. So she takes him around and she shows it and everything. She's very proud of how she had decorated and everything. And she showed me her daughter's room. But the, the couple of hours that we were there, he had that girl, he made her change clothes four times and each outfit got more and more revealing. So the one at the end, she had like this skimpy, like tube top thing and then some short shorts that were like showing the back of her cheeks and all that stuff. And it's like all the guys were looking at him like, man, what are you doing? This is your wife. What are you, you tripping? And all the women were disgusted. I've never seen anything like that. And the girl looked so ashamed. I heard they got it. You know, she evidently just could take it yeah. and she left him. But he but, still got um, to abuse her for a certain amount of years, you know, and that's what they're right. counting. So, and I didn't know that he was like that, you know. So it was, it was, girl, I'm telling you, I have never seen no mess like that in my life. And well, I've seen it like that since. I've seen a woman that was forced to be, to go to swinger clubs and actually do stuff with other couples because her that's what her husband wanted. So that's worse. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so, this may have been leading up to that, you know what I mean? Because the way... He was trying to show, he was putting her on display. It, like, it did have a component of that to it. I was yeah. very uncomfortable. I can tell you, I just, it was extremely uncomfortable. And then I was worried about her six-year-old daughter. You know, well, people, right, he was right. acting. You know, yeah, it was, children, even though I was not like, you know, I don't believe that I was ever physically violated, but it was visually, because my father was a teacher, you know, like he put on displays all the time in front of a classroom. And so that's how he, delivered his messages kind of and so he was always nude and he would do things like if I was watching TV he would come in and my if my mother was sitting next to me he would come into the room naked with an erection and he would say you have to take care of this and she, my mother would be forced to go in the bedroom with him and if if she didn't do it then it would be a huge fight and then he would switch the TV off and then I would start crying because the TV was my only interaction I was not allowed to play with friends or go outside or anything so like, yeah, like he had the whole thing set up to coerce her to do what he wanted whenever he wanted it. And he was, he took great pleasure in the fact that he could do that. And he was a sadist and, and he did it in front of me. Like he did it in front of his daughter. And I'm talking about for years, I had to see and hear things like this. And it got so bad because my mother was slowly brainwashed into it. And it got to the point where she would put on sexual displays. Like if I was sitting on the couch and they were sitting next to me, they would start doing things that were sexual right in front of me and then if I wanted if, if I wanted to not see that I would have to get up and leave the room and leave my show and so he was setting me up to have to see him doing oh, yeah yeah that guy he's got some serious problems well I'm happy yeah. you got away from him so you can start getting yourself together you know I'm sorry for the path that you had to take you know Thank you're a beautiful you. you're a beautiful woman and you seem you know very articulate and smart you're able to to express this and I know it's probably bringing up some dreadful memories but yeah. I want you to know you know I'm a, I, I appreciate you sharing because I'm hoping that by us doing this show it'll get the attention of someone who maybe was thinking about doing this and they won't and it'll make them more aware of how to weed out guys with these tendencies if they're already in you know already in the catalogs or on the websites or whatever 
you know, the number one is just do it organically through friends. Like try to go there and just see who you can meet through through friends. Do a foreign exchange program. If you really want to go to that country and meet a guy from over there, just go over there as a student or something. And that way you can do your own um, research and also learn how to use, um, like today we have this wonderful tool, the internet. My mom didn't have it. <laughs> We do, and so we can actually use online services to check up on this guy's past, and we can contact exes. And the number one way, I learned this from another profile, a really wonderful profile of a lady who had been stalked, but basically she says that a lot of times these predators have people that they date casually so that they'll have a good dating record and they can refer you to that person. But the real trauma was done to like another woman that they don't tell you about. So you have to find out about all of uh. And you have to get somebody who is in a vulnerable position with them. Because if it's somebody that they just casually dated but never lived with, that person's going to be like, oh, yeah, they're fine. But you have to get the woman who was pregnant with him or lived with him or was in some type of a vulnerable situation. And that woman is going to have the real scoop. So you keep digging until you find it. And just dig into, tr see if you can see what he's browsing online. Mm -hmm. That's really that's really big because a lot of times these guys are on the MGTOW. Honestly, like if I was in the position where I was researching someone and I found out that they even looked at one MGTOW site, I would just like instantly block their number from my phone. Oh, heck yeah. Because and, and try to find out. Like, I don't want to say like hacker, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you have to protect yourself. Hack away. <laughs> and now there's a digital footprint of almost everything that people are, are doing on their phone and on, online and um, you have to learn learn how to use these resources in order to protect yourself because the danger is real. So it's unbelievable. Yeah. So let's say I know you wanna you know you're gonna get started and um, I'm happy to be part of your launch. So can you share with the viewers how they can get involved in this in you know educating women about the mail order bride industry, maybe help someone if they're in a bad situation and, and they don't know what to do to get out of it. So what, what's going on? What you doing? Okay, uh, all right. Uh, this opportunity came up really fast and <laughs> I hadn't thought of, I, I was just posting on YouTube and I was going on Mail Order Bride YouTube where they try to promote it as a good lifestyle. And I was posting, don't do it. This is what happened, blah, blah, blah. And, and your channel was one of the things that I posted on. So I did never intended to become like a real activist, but since I got this opportunity, I did put together a Facebook page because I run a few other Facebook pages like for tiny houses and stuff like that. And this is, um, I never thought of actually running a Facebook page for this particular topic, but it seems like I really, really should. And so um, <laughs> since I was already posting about it everywhere, right? And living in the comments section of other people's. <laughs> so um, I made, a, um, it says, uh, mail order brides are human trafficking and then the url is like facebook forward slash help mail order brides now so if you want to collect on that web page and start just posting the information because i try to do a facebook search and a google search and there really isn't a website like that that just openly and plainly states about mail order brides i know there's one site called don't sell bodies and it's by a woman who was trafficked by her parents to pay for her school can you believe it? she's asian and the parents made her sleep with guys to pay for her college because they didn't want to pay for it so now oh she my has, god what is wrong with these people that's because over in their culture this has been going on for thousands of years you have to understand that we're in a bubble we're in like the one of the few bubbles in the world where this does not happen so we have to spread the bubble and spread it out over the whole world right so um oh my god i know so when it's going to be a lot of work so basically like um there's no facebook page specifically for a mail order bride so i just made one and if you want to come over there it's facebook forward slash help mail order brides now and i would like to just focus on that one topic even though there are lots of slavery topics throughout the world this is the one that i particularly come from so i figured i'd just focus on that and um and so i think it'll be very worth a very worthwhile cause yeah, seriously. I mean, and it's under people's noses. Like there could be one right next door to you and you don't even know it because they're so brainwashed that they don't know how to at, reach out and ask for help. And so, you know, like, and, and it's the same way with all abusers. Like, you know, there's always like a secretive component because then if people find out the game is over and they don't get any more narcissistic supply. So they always have this stuff undercover and mail order brides are just one of the things that could be happening in, in your neighborhood which it was in mine, in my house. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Yeah. But I was reading some statistics. It's like you know, uh, uh, human trafficking has surpassed drug trafficking as the number one revenue for you know underground revenue worldwide. Human trafficking has now usurped drug dealing. Right. Well, when time, you know, you have to understand we went into a recession and historically, whenever there's a recession, the women and children are sold. So that's what's happening. And it's up to us to to stop that, to advance the human race so that they don't turn to this as an income source. Yeah. Well, Christine, I want to thank you for stopping well, in and talking about this tough subject with me. Breathe, yeah. girlfriend. Take a breath. Woosa. It's been hard to get I, it out. I was having I, know. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And No, you are very brave. Uh, you're very brave. And I will do everything I can to help, you know, promote your page and get your, your name and the, uh, your cause out there to people. So I will do what I can do to help you because I think this is very important. It's like, you know, women, we, women worldwide, we got to stick together. That's yeah. the only way we're going to survive. That's the only way. Yeah. And it's going to be hard. They fight back. So yeah, but we got, there's more of us than there are them. <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity, Deborah. You no problem at all. And thank you very much for coming. I'll thank see you me. later. Good night. All right, you guys, um, that was Christine, and um, she is doing all she can to help uh, women become aware of what's going on here. I want you guys to, you know, take a look at her page and like it, to help mail order bright. Well, she said the name. I don't want to screw it up, but, um, you know, go over there, like the page, and then help spread the word. Because as you know, these women are coming from every country, even Africa, you know, they're coming from the islands, they're coming from everywhere, you know, Finland, Philippines, all throughout Southeast Asia. And these are women that have little opportunities for the kind of things that we take for granted. And they're being used and used up and they're being murdered by these men like trash because they feel like you know, I could just buy another one. This is, a, this is a very dangerous time. And even for girls who don't want to be a part of the sex trafficking industry, they're being snatched off the streets of America and forced into it. So all in all, ladies, we got, you know, we got a lot of work to do. This is one part. Uh, and then you know we, we'll work on the other parts later. But I did want to uh, present this information to you, and I hope that it surprise, provides some great education and information that you can go out and share with other women in the communities. All right, this is Deb Cooper from SurvivingDating.com signing off on another topic Thursday. We'll be back next week with another hot topic for you, and then on the weekend uh, for some more dating advice. All right, thanks you guys for coming through. <music>